I never really start with anything straight out of my imagination. It's, it's always really important for me to start with something that already exists. The goal is to make a, a good abstract painting. And in my opinion, that's also like the hardest thing there is to do in painting. So I kind of cheat. I have to find you know, a method and a rhythm to be able to, to, to produce that. So with, with these Noah paintings, these to me are kind of the most finished, realized versions of a non-objective painting that I've made. I start with an image of a, a drawing that my brother drew of me three days after I was born. Um, it doesn't really have to do with childhood, just the fact that this was something that I was always really familiar with looking at in the house I grew up. It was hanging up, you know, in the same room as uh, plenty of other artwork, but it was just as familiar to me as, as like a grandfather clock would be. I made paintings of this blown up for about a year. And then it led me to, I made a rubber stamp of, uh, of the image and it allowed me to uh, create a pattern with it. By doing that and overlapping these pieces, I ended up with a lot of little tight details that, that really, you know, called my name to paint it. It really became what I wanted it to do as far as taking a real thing and by, by just that use of pattern, it, it started to make it abstract. Going over and over again, I got to a, even a, a, you know, a bigger pattern, overlaying it countless times. And one thing I try to do when it comes to the paintings of it is I stick you know, really to the grid. There's nothing free-formed about it. I really have to paint it line for line. So every eyeball and hand and toe, all those things are, are in here, and it's important that they're all there. Uh, you know, I want to make these big gestural abstract paintings, but I can't allow myself to have that kind of freedom. So that's why I have to work in a system like this. But they're getting looser enough to where they look like maybe someone had stepped into a studio and really, really had fun with paint as opposed to, you know, this meticulous way of actually building them block by block and, and drawing by drawing. I'm interested in how these things actually sort of manifest in an environment more than as standalone paintings and how there's this kind of vision of them all speaking to each other, if you will. The idea with the opportunity to show these paintings, I want to put as much into it as, as I possibly can. And um, because I think of a pattern and symmetry and all these things and even a grid as very abstract ideas, the pattern speaking here mostly by turning that into a wallpaper, you know, it really blurs the, the whole connection of all of it. I, I'd, I'd like, I want to put just as much into one painting as you can you know if you have the opportunity to do that to a whole space then, then you know then why not and so by making that a wallpaper gives me what i want to see out of out of an artwork C complete you know packed detail almost that that obsessive overworked quality to things that i actually do really like you know you want them to take over and i think it is uh you know, it's a privilege to be able to have opportunities to show these things and to do these things in life. And, and, and I think you kind of have to give it your all and put, you know, if, you, if you're lucky enough to be able to do these things, well, you better go all out every time. And that was kind of one idea with the, with the wallpapers to try to go all out and create an entire environment of this pattern. It's about building uh, a hierarchy that f folds into its structure or maybe even acts as its undergirding a, a personal history. And I'm curious how much of that you have to let go in these works. They certainly are personal. I mean, I think, you know, some artists get, uh, you know, shit on because they, their artwork is too personal. But, but in reality, every, of course, of course, everybody's artwork is personal to them. Of course it is. You wouldn't, 
you, you know, you couldn't be made if it wasn't personal to the artist. I think by trying to make non-objective paintings, it takes a little bit of that out just uh, visually to somebody, you know, by, by, if it was just the single figure, you know, it, it's, it's obvious, you know what you're looking at, you can relate it to a childhood work, you know, you could relate it to a million things, but, but by, you know, trying your best to abstract it, um, I hope it erases some of that. It takes I'm, me out of step. I'm curious about the erasure. So it's almost hidden in it, but it's there. And then also they just culminate in kind of fascinating things to look at. You know what I mean? Well, that's, that's you know, the goal I think with art is you want something nice to look at and you want to get somebody excited about what they're looking at. I, I love the fact knowing that trying to reveal the process and making sure that those original drawings are shown or talked about, but you know, really they don't, they don't have to be there. I think that's a afterthought and not, you know, really before. Hopefully you can look at the picture and think that it's finished and try to get lost at it, you know, before you, if you care to even understand how and why it was made, you know, then that's second. I think the other hierarchy that's folded into these and the other history for that matter is kind of a history of painting, especially history of modernity. But really beyond that, it goes farther back than modernity, I think, in moments. Every painting almost seems to be a reevaluation of the history of painting in, in, it, in whatever small way. Sometimes it's a, an affectation that is sort of sought through scale. And That's what I mean about being, a, you know, you gotta deal with every, all these paintings. You, you can take from so much now. Every time I think of like an abstract brush stroke, I love the way they talk about before Cezanne, there's a great quote, if you cut up a painting of a still life, then you had just a little patchwork in your hand, it would look like you had a piece of an apple and a, and a bowl and the tablecloth in your hand. But then if you did that to a Cezanne painting and you cut that out, you're just holding brush strokes. There's no apple, there's nothing else there. You could take that same thought to a painting like this where in the beginning it was so much about the grid granted i'm not painting an apple or something you know very realistic but i was sticking to this original layout and this original form of of, of this painting and now you know truly it really is just brush strokes and loose brush strokes and i think so that can be said the same for you know non-objective paintings or objective paintings that he was making but at the same time you know he i guess the, you know that's the beginning of really making things not objective in the same way. Often I think of uh, Matisse in terms of the way they're worked, you know what I mean? It's like this incredible span, um, especially at the bottom of them. So these things are thought of largely as grisaille paintings, but they're anything but. I mean, there's a ton of color in them, you know? Yeah. Um, I like how it sort of seems to sort of weight the, the bottom of each painting down too, which is this other sort of structural element in them that, are, that I'm drawing. Yeah, to. you know, and that's one thing, I'm by no means the first person to kind of leave a little of the process. Part of it happens just by the height that they're getting worked on and you know, you're not sitting in a chair all day, so the bottom doesn't get quite as much attention as the, the middle of the paintings probably receive the most, the most work, but also, you know, I mean, that's a thing in painting to kind of peel off a layer and re reveal how it was made. It's really interesting to me because I think of every painting as an object in a funny way. Um, uh, I do too, I totally do. I can't, I, I can't help, I, don't, I couldn't think about, I wish I had a broad, more broadening sense, a more spiritual sense of painting, but I really don't. To me they are, you're making a physical object. Right. That is supposed to, I mean its job in the end is to challenge a little and edify a little and delight a little, you know. Hopefully, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a great soup. <laughs> There's it's a good soup that hopefully no one's ever seen or tasted before. <laughs> right. You know, that's the, to me that's the, that that's a good goal. If you're making something that no one's ever seen, even if it's bad, if no one's ever seen it, you you're you're doing something. Actually, that that idea of recipe as metaphor in the Noah paintings in particular is interesting to me because they're all very very different, but they all come from. Uh, a couple basic ingredients and you're just sort of playing it's with a recipe. It's a recipe. Yeah. They are recipe paintings. You know, the recipe paintings that I want to appear very gestural. Yeah. In a funny way, they do to the nth degree what these paintings do also, which is uh, dealing with space. 
Um, well, the grit is foremost. It is put right up front and it doesn't go away on these. So it's there, you know, like I say, I talk about the grid being, you know, it's a way of measurement. It's a way of keeping time. You know, it's all those things. It's a calendar and a tape measure. But it's also, to me, a found object. It's not, it's not something I made up, you know what I mean? The idea that that exists more tangibly in these paintings is, is interesting as well. The inclusion of the Elder Bierman logo as a graphic element. One of the reasons it works great is the same way, you know, this, the whole background of this is made up of my mom's maiden name, which is Kadoshis, a Lithuanian name. If my mom's maiden name would have been Smith, and the Elder Bierman logo was the Coca-Cola logo, you know, it wouldn't work. You show an Elder Bierman painting in any other part of the world, it's... it's yeah, it doesn't come off it as... Doesn't, it, there's nothing for anybody else to relate it to, you know? It doesn't come off as romantic to me, which is the thing I love about it. There's so much romance in it, but you've kind of put the reins on it, if you will. It's mine now. Right. I could decode your paintings for a long time, you know? Well, that's good. You know, I hope I hope that's what people can. I hope people think and decode them very differently than I ever would. Yeah. And by using things that uh, no one knows what they are, like that, you know, abstract words. If I'm not around to explain it, you know, I, I should hope that there's nothing left to do but decode it on your own or, or think about take your own, you know, meaning from it. I'm also curious if you see process-wise these as an inversion of these. So with these, the grid was the starting point that you worked over. And for these, the grid is to the fore. It's hard for me to kind of answer that just because the process and doing them is so different. You know, I want the outcome, the final like look of them to be hopefully the same, but, but uh, they're made so differently that it's just another recipe of the soup. One of the things I wanted to do, I remember when it, first made start working on these paintings was put as much like every kind of bit of knowledge I knew how to make a painting into one painting so there was you know pure painting with the brush there's drawing there's carving and there was printing there was kind of everything I knew how to do layered into one painting and that was an important thing when I when I started these and how to try to sink all of it into one I think there's a plenty of artists and painters that certainly can, can do and do do a whole lot, but to try to put it all together is, is uh, a little tricky or maybe doesn't get done a lot. You seem to be dealing with uh, a, a kind of attention that is about this much space a lot of the time, um, but at the same time it deals with a kind of vastness too. But the actual labor takes place like you're so close to them, you know what I mean? It's about uh, your proximity to all of those ideas in terms of how they manifest in paintings. It's about a, a kind of attention that takes place in two or three feet. It goes also back to the grid, the, to the grid though, you know, square by square. That's also a problem with these damn things, especially when you're working on pictures this size. A good half of the time, if not more, they're spent flat. On the uh, you know on a table working on them and when you're when you're this close to something and nothing else is outside your vision you can be working for days and days and then you lift it up and you you either hit a home run or it was or you you know you screwed yeah. up for four days in a row you can't tell what you're it's it's hard to you know you can only focus on what's in front of you <laughs> that's why ma making smaller pictures would be uh, a good thing to 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 do and to get good at. Rusty and 